You are listening to Down Home. The sweet science. Boxing. It is sport at its rawest. Two combatants facing one another in a ring. My grandfather turned me on to boxing. I remember huddling around our little cathode ray tube TV with him and my cousin Corey watching one of the epic 1970s battles like Ali Frazier or Larry Holmes versus Ken Norton. These belts were always at night and always way past my bedtime. I remember my grandmother calling down for me to go to bed. My grandfather was a quiet man, but his response was always the same. Edith, leave those children alone. We're watching the fights. It so happens that one of the boxers that paved the way for champions like Ollie, Frazier, Holmes, and Norton was a Scotian. George Dixon, a.k.a. Little Chocolate. I'm Derek Wise, and on behalf of Jay Jones, welcome to Down Home, the Nova Scotian Experience by Two Black Men. Breaking new crab, breaking new crab, breaking new crab, sip a breaking new crab, breaking new crab, breaking new crab, sip a breaking new crab, breaking new crab, breaking new crab, sip a breaking new crab, breaking new crab, breaking new crab, yeah. On a high plateau from the one down below. So, how did you want to go about this? Well, let's just talk about it, I guess, man. Like, you know, um, he, the dude led a, a pretty interesting life. Yeah. I had thought that he spent more time in Canada than he actually did. So he, he, he spent a lot of time in Boston, I guess. Uh, Boston and New York. Yeah. 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 But he traveled all around the States, though, boxing, right? Mm-hmm. But he he left um, Halifax pretty early though. Born July 29th, 1870 in Africville, Nova Scotia, George Dixon was a small kid. By the age of 16, he was five foot three and weighed about 90 pounds. Dixon worked as a photography assistant and was introduced to the world of boxing through his job. Boxers used to come into the studio and get their pictures taken. You know those old-timey pictures with the boxer facing off to one side, sort of looking at a non-existing opponent out of the camera frame? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to say just when Dixon started training. It's not well documented. But he did have his first professional bout at the age of 16 in 1886. Dixon was a natural athlete, quick and sound defensively, with a bob and weave style. He had speed, agility, and power. His left hand jab was dangerous. The match took place in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and it was against a fighter named Young Johnson. Dixon KO'd his opponent in three rounds. He actually did. He had a he had a pretty lucrative ca- career at the beginning like yeah winning all kinds of money man after a decision by dixon's family to move to boston his boxing career took off he went undefeated in a two-year span his success led him to a bantamweight championship bout with tommy spider kelly the fight took place on may 10th 1888 in boston Spider stood five foot four and weighed 105 pounds and was described as a tough and scrappy boxer. Some sources say that Dixon KO'd him in the ninth round. Some say it was the eighth. Either way, Dixon won and Spider never wanted anything to do with Dixon again as he never sought a rematch. Dixon won further boxing acclaim after four battles with Hank Brennan. Two of the fights took place at the Athenian Club. One took place at the Pelican Club. All of the belts were in Boston. Brennan was an Irish-born Boston fighter, said to be a rising star at the time. And he was also known as the pride of Boston. Some say that Brennan came from the bare-fisted boxing scene, but after exhibiting a fair amount of skill in the ring, he decided to go pro. 
The first match was June 21st, 1888. Dixon came away with a win in 14 rounds. The other three matches were draws. Brandon kind of faded into obscurity after that, but George Dixon was just getting started. In 1889, Dixon won eight belts, including one where the police intervened. This was on December 11th against Mike Sullivan in New Bedford, which is near Boston. Can you imagine? You're boxing and the match is so lopsided that someone calls the cops. I'm, of course I'm joking, this probably wasn't the case. During this time period there were no governing bodies, no boxing commission, in fact gambling ruled the boxing world back then. So most of the time these boxing matches took place in boxing clubs, but sometimes they didn't. It's not out of the realm of possibility to think that this match was in a building somewhere and the crowd of people drew the interest of police. According to historian Tracy Callis, Dixon wasn't only fighting his opponent, but the prevailing racist attitude of the time. Often in order to get a fight, Dixon had to carry the other boxer. That is, he had to agree not to knock his opponent out right away. Or he had to agree to, to weird rules that made it tough to score an outright win. Rules like the match would be called a draw unless Dixon knocked his opponent out cold. 1890 started off the same as 1889 for Dixon in his boxing career. More wins. Most notably against Cal McCarthy. The two boxers employed similar styles, quick hands with a heavy reliance on the left hand jab. So it's no surprise that the bout went the distance. The surprising fact of the fight was that Dixon won a 70 round decision. That's right, I said 70 rounds. With what we know today about how harmful contact sports are, it's hard to believe that a boxing match would be allowed to go on for so long. Although in a subsequent rematch, Dixon knocked McCarthy out cold in the third round, but the referee allowed McCarthy's corner to drag him off of the canvas and revive him and let the fight to continue. Dixon ended up knocking him out cold anyway. So the wins continued to pile up in 1890, but there were grumblings in the boxing community that yeah, Dixon was a good bantamweight, but he wasn't as good as that kid across the pond in England. They were talking about Edwin Nunk Wallace. Nunk was the official English bantamweight champ. A little taller than Dixon, Nunk was described as a scrappy fighter that moved well and hit very hard. Remember, because there was no boxing commission, there was never a clear path to a world championship for any fighter, let alone a black Canadian fighter. So on May 3rd, 1890, Dixon set sail with his manager, Tom O'Rourke, for the UK on board the Catalina. Arriving May 12th in Liverpool, England, Dixon and his manager had arranged a tune-up fight a few days later with a boxer named Billy Willis. This happened before they traveled to London to face Nunk Wallace. Not much is known about this fight, but Dixon did beat his opponent. So it was on to London. The bout with Nunk took place on June 27th, 1890. Dixon made quick work of Nunk, knocking him out in the fourth round. Dixon was now considered the world bantamweight champion. From the start of his career on November 1st, 1886 until his decision to move up weight classes in 1891, Dixon ruled the bantamweight division, taking on all comers and becoming an undefeated world champion. In some boxing circles, Dixon is considered the best boxer in the 19th century. He also found success as a featherweight as well, becoming featherweight champ from 1891 to 1896, and then again from 1898 until the turn of the century, 1900. You know that, yeah. and that's not a that's not a plane ride. That's a that's a boat trip going to the yeah, UK, man. For sure, man. Like in, like in those like, days and times. Yeah, like it would take you three weeks yeah. <laughs> to, to get there. Right? Maybe that's why he was so innovative with uh, training as well. Like he was a self-taught boss, boxer apparently, and he came up. He's said to may have invented this uh, shadow boxing. 
Over his career, Dixon was known as a cerebral fighter who pioneered uh, a number of different uh, strategies, training strategies like shadow boxing, the use of a heavy bag, uh, throwing punches with hand weights, things of that nature. And this also attributed to the fact that he was a heavy hitter, at, even at that small stature. He was a heavy hitter. His, his, his jab was, was uh, formidable and his right cross was heavy and stiff. Yeah, it, I think his style was leaning towards defensive. Mm -hmm. um, I think I saw a similar clip to you and like he, he had a style where he would lean back a little bit. Yeah. And he'd weave back and forth. Yeah. And then he, and like he would counter punch, right? Right. So it was um, all defense. Yeah. Yeah. So he's probably similar, pro different style, of course, but similar to uh, like Mayweather. Yeah. Like a, a style where you're, you're not going to get hit a lot, but you dole out a little bit of uh, punishment kind of thing. Yeah. With counter punches. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what made, uh, you know, Mayweather so good defensively. Yeah. He traveled with only his uh, his promoter. Mm -hmm. So as you said, he trained himself. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It says his, his longtime his promoter manager, yeah. Tom O'Rourke. And maybe who, maybe his wife, wife who was his uh, was his uh, manager's sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those two. So he didn't have a, a large entourage, not like the. Not like the brown bomber back in the day, right? Who yeah, had a yeah, huge, yeah. huge. That's where all his money went. Well, apparently with Dixon, he he was always. Uh, I wonder what he faced in Africville because he was always sort of an advocate for um, using his platform to fight racism, and he gave a lot of his earnings away to help support black communities. Oh yeah, but even with that. Um, I, th I think he he liked a little bit of luxury, man. Like uh, it said that he um, really enjoyed fine clothes. He enjoyed gambling mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, you know, even even though he didn't travel with a lot of people, I I'm sure the manager and the sister took their fair share of money from him. Too. Yeah, and sure. I, have, I have no idea if that's the case. No, I know what you're saying. But, you know, look at look at our, our most recent examples. Look at, uh, you know, Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. who who earned over 200 million dollars in his career and yeah at one point he was uh destitute yeah you know in, in between uh king and all the people around him he gave uh uh his ex-wife a lot of money at one point yeah yeah uh so and it seems like that was the case back then too you know yeah. it happened with joe lewis as well happened know? with joe lewis yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, but who actually he, uh visited Africville. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, the, the Nova Scotia has a long history of, um, of uh, elite athletes, but this guy seemed to be the first, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, the, and one, one resource actually said he might be the first bat black athlete to be named a world champion in any sport. Cause it was, it happened in like 1890. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but you wonder if, if, um, cause he, he made a lot of people around the money. So mm -hmm. that, that probably pushed them out there. But then, um, I think you brought this up before he, he, there was some sort of, uh, um, exhibition in new Orleans and he like, he took out the amateur champ and broke his nose in like six rounds or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then after that, that club banned, all interracial boxing right mm -hmm, yeah. and it seemed to be a wave that was starting to happen around that time yeah and it really affected boxers going forward yeah yeah and they weren't yeah. making as much money and everything no. like that yeah but jack johnson has an interesting story too though it almost mirrored but the thing the, the thing with jack johnson he he came along when they were putting roadblocks up yeah right um, yeah. all against uh, black boxers and he, he had to break through that yeah it seems as though Dixon was pushed forward to earn money mm -hmm. but then things started happening like oh my god the, this this box was too good let's let's ban all interracial boxing yeah where Jack Johnson was already he was he was born during that time right yeah yeah 
but he 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 kind of had the same ills. He liked to gamble. He liked like, to drive fast cars. Yeah. And he, uh, yeah. yeah, he 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 yeah he didn't care. He liked he liked his women, and uh, yeah, he would go across state lines and the sundown towns, and yeah, he everything. didn't care. Nope, didn't care, man. <laughs> um, and it seems as though Dixon kind of was the predecessor to that type of ad. Like I'm good, I'm gonna beat you. Yeah, you know, um, there's there's no there's no mention of his uh, attitude. But the thing is, though, with Jack Johnson. There were a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot more press yeah. for him. Yeah, of course. Right. There was a lot more press for him. The other thing is the weight class, like mm -hmm. um, the heavyweight division has always been the, um, or until recently anyway, has always been like the, the premier weight division. Yeah. Right? The pinnacle. Yeah. The pinnacle where, and so you wonder if that was the reason why uh dixon was able to uh, was allowed to go he was like oh look at this young fella this mm -hmm. this will be interesting kind of thing let him let yeah. him box he's gonna get his, his ass whooped and then he goes and he whoops everyone's ass yeah yeah <laughs> big time yeah five three 120 pounds yeah um you know and uh yeah he was a small dude but uh apparently his power his hand power was just amazing and he used to train he actually used to shadow box with dumbbells in his hand yeah Apparently, he made two hundred fifty thousand dollars U.S. Yeah. during his career. Yeah. That's unadjusted. Yeah, that's a lot of money, man. Back then, it's, it's a lot of money now. Two <laughs> hundred. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah, eight yeah. and a half. So eight and a half million dollars he earned over his adjusted for today's yeah, dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's cool. that's that's a chunk of change, man. Yeah. As a lot of aging fighters do, he stayed in the ring a bit too long. From 1900 to 1906, he fought a few draws and suffered defeats to fighters that his younger self would have easily won. But it is questionable how many of those losses were actually losses. Oftentimes, Dixon would outbox his opponent only to lose the belt because of a racist ref. And sadly, uh he ended up in poverty. Yeah, like uh, in the streets of New York. So he never came back to Nova Scotia. No. Mm. So he, he ended up in New York on the streets. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a sad story, man. Very sad. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, he's uh, considering like he's from Africville, which is pretty cool, you know, out of all the tragedy and stuff during that time like you can you know just like the community itself is a is a story of like fighting and facing mm -hmm. racial barriers you know yeah and it's good to see like that fighting spirit you know yeah he carried with him i guess yeah but all of like all of his accolades he didn't earn quite a few accolades while he was living but um yeah like all the the sports hall of fames and whatnot that that happened years after he passed after, away yeah. though yeah like i think the first one was ninth in the 50s mm -hmm. yeah right yeah and the latest one was like 2011 the international boxing uh, uh hall of fame recognized him in yeah. 2011 i think it was yeah and he got some sort of uh he got like a he earned a national designation here in canada as well oh did he yeah Remember, there's no governing or sanctioning body back then, so it's hard to know how many belts Dixon actually fought. Some boxing experts think he fought hundreds of professional belts, and maybe even more exhibition belts. Now, his longtime manager, Tom O'Rourke, claimed that Dixon fought over 800 times. Now, this might be due to Dixon establishing a vaudeville troupe, which he called the George Dixon Specialty Company. Now, this uh, vaudeville troupe toured Canada and the United States. And during that time period, Dixon probably fought hundreds upon hundreds of uh, little exhibition belts. Now, George Dixon was awarded a number of things uh, long after his death he was named to the canada sports hall of fame 
Uh, he was also named the Ring Magazine's Hall of Fame. And most recently in 2011, the International Boxing Hall of Fame as well. As Jay was saying, uh, George Dixon died in January 1908 in New York City at 37 years of old, penniless and living on the streets and succumbing to the detrimental effects of alcoholism, uh, basically dying in a hospital. Uh, definitely not the fitting end to a champion that he was. You have been listening to Down Home. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. On a high plateau, from the one down below to the future of the funk, getting lost in the flow. Contact with the spot, McX. Now it's time to flex with the force from the soul, reaching all aspects, getting deep. No time to sleep as you reach your next phase, laying it all on the line. New trail start to blaze, it's a fire inside. A brand new path, breaking down the sum to one, feeling free. I just laugh with the joy of a beat boy, just kicking it live. A connection so strong, transcribed with the vibe like magic prescribed. Only to see the perfect blend like a diamond in the rough Ready to drop a perfect gem, it's time to shine so fine To see what you find, revolution starts with the evolution of the mind It's a rhythm of circumference that rotates around to the surface with a purpose Breaking new ground Breaking new ground Flying high Wanna keep living my life The song, Breaking New Ground From... Breakdown. I wanna live my life like music.